that clap is still off beat for me. It sounds kind of weird. Is it? But the audience will never hear it. Yeah. Who cares? All right, <laughs> what's up, everybody? How's it going? <laughs> pretty good, pretty good. At this point, I feel like the clap now. shouldn't yeah. even matter. We're just going to have to align it some other way. Oh, right, yeah. I mean... You know, it just sounds weird on my part, that's all. Yeah. Like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Something they'll never hear. Yeah. But uh, you're hearing us now, folks. Matt and Parth here. Yep. Uh, second episode of the week. Meeting up for a second time. Mm-hmm. Uh, hope you're doing well. How are you doing, Parth? Uh, doing fantastic. Um, I was looking forward to this one because uh, it's scary. Yeah, for some reason. <laughs> yeah. I was kind of concerned. Or not concerned, but... You know, you want to do uh, an Academy episode on nuclear weapons, folks. Yes. Nuclear and weapons. my initial thought was, uh, sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> I was... Uh, kind of weird, but yeah. I was just... I ended up watching this one... A couple of videos on it randomly. I don't know how they showed up on my on my suggested box, right? I guess it was because I was oh, yeah. like watching something from one channel and that same channel had the suggested, algorithm gets to you. you know... Yeah. So I ended up watching that, and I'm like, you know what? This is so interesting. We should do one on this, you know? And it's scary. It's legitimately scary, like, the facts that people don't know about nukes and and the potential for, you know, world destruction, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's very dramatic of you to say. Yeah. yeah. So the concept of nuclear in general yeah. is, is very complex and very detailed. So a lot of people don't tend to dive deep into it, although yeah. there is a ton of YouTube uh videos out there and a, and a bunch of articles and research but you know no, no one really takes the time to you know dive into it other than watching a two minute video on youtube yeah so hopefully we uh we kind of did some research and we're gonna treat you to a little education right now folks yep. and so far um we're gonna be talking about nuclear energy nuclear weapons and just the overall state of it now yeah so I think it's safe to say that you did a lot more research than I have, or you have a lot more exposure to to this topic than I have. Possibly, um, I have no idea. To be honest, we'll have to see we'll <laughs> as find we out go today. on. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, <laughs> it's funny because you know when people say so. So one of the funny jokes is that some people will say nuclear, some people will say nuclear, and I've noticed that you say nuclear, and that's just like nuclear. Yeah. How, how do you say nuclear? <laughs> nuclear. Nuclear. <laughs> so apparently, it's actually really. Nuclear. I have never noticed. Yeah, it's actually nuclear. Nuclear. Oh my god! <laughs> I think it's like ingrained in my mouth. Like it doesn't want to change the. <laughs> <laughs> no, dude, you're not the only one. There's yeah. a lot of people. <laughs> oh my god! Is it contagious? <laughs> <laughs> it very well, might be. Do I have disease? <laughs> that's funny. That's that's funny. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So Parth has coffee right now, so he's serious about this. Uh, oh, yeah. I have a beer, so I'm not serious about this. Oh, uh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> more relaxed, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I never noticed it actually. Nuclear? Oh, who knows? Yeah. Comment uh, in the comments below. What do you say? <laughs> <laughs> I know, yeah, right. If you have the time. Yeah. But let's get into it. All right. So, nuke. I can't. I was afraid to say it right there. <laughs> you so. <can> <laughs> Nukes in general, uh, weapons of mass destruction, uh, energy, all of it. So, in in one sentence, can you describe or define a weapon of mass destruction? Uh, that's a good question. I think I would, if I had to choose something, I would just say something that's... Ah, oh, I mean, I can't really describe it by definition. All I can say is that it's big, it's destructive... Big. It's it literally in the definition. <laughs> I would have to say hydrogen bombs. <laughs> um, you know, just just picture a huge ball of fire wiping out cities and people. That's essentially all I can really say about it. And obviously there's yeah, science behind I'm, it, but you know. There is science behind it. So I think uh, a good analogy to this kind of, uh, you know, nuclear disaster mm-hmm. is like a meteor or uh, like an asteroid hitting Earth. Yeah. Uh, that it's pretty much on the level of that. Um, I mean, even a small asteroid can can wipe out an entire city. So we're going to be talking about a lot of uh, destruction in, in this type of episode. And yep. it's, is it going to be attractive? Who knows? But uh-huh. uh, I would say, 
to be honest, uh, a nuclear weapon. It, it's got to be some kind of uh, misuse of energy. That's what I would define it as. Okay. Because initially, uh, I think the discovery of, of uranium, I think it was used to produce a massive amount of energy. And it came to scientists later throughout uh, history that they could actually use it for, you know, destruction and, and chaos. Hmm. Uh, that's what I think it is. Because I think of uh, nuclear energy, so nuclear uh, power plants, uh, the type of energy that's kind of controversial. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have these power plants producing a massive amount of energy, and it could be end up uh, providing a good uh cause to the world essentially right because those power plants provide a ton of energy compared to other sources of energy like yeah. fossil fuels um natural gases solar energy so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's what i think of initially it's like oh this could this is a initially a good thing because you can use it for good right but not many people have used it uh for good in the past i mean we've throughout history we know of two atomic bombs that were dropped um uh, at the end of World War Two, yeah, and that pretty much ended uh, the war of all wars, <laughs> yeah. right there. So it's kind of scary to think about. Yeah, what do you think about that though? The, actually, throughout history, there were atomic bombs used on people. Yeah, that's so, oh god, it's, a, it's, a, little, it's yeah. a little insane. I know there were, I think, almost close to a thousand nuclear tests done. Um, and two were actually used on people on purpose um, for war purposes, obviously, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But mm -hmm. that, you know, there's multiple thoughts that I have on that. Number one, it was a planned thing, right? There were consequences and side effects that the U.S. was considering. And, you know, there were alternatives to dropping nukes to end the war because, you know, multiple things. Number one, the Soviet Union was actually going to um, invade Japan anyways with their you know Navy and they were going to force them to surrender um, and the and Japan actually was close to surrendering but what ended up happening is they wanted to surrender to the US they knew that it was much better apparently uh, don't know why but I'm assuming it has something to do with you know if they surrendered to the Soviet Union the terms and conditions will be much harsher or something like that right that makes sense yeah um it, yeah much better to surrender to the free world than you know to communism <laughs> but <laughs> but that's a bad word you can't say that on here <laughs> yeah i know right that word is outlawed <laughs> what's it called yeah, the, the the hate speech yeah it's hate speech <laughs> the hate speech <laughs> The compelled speech, no freedom of speech. Yeah. Um, yeah, back back in history, things were kind of brutal back then. So, um, I think most people don't know that uh, Russia had a big part in World War II. Yeah, uh, it wasn't just the U.S. came in on their uh, a bald eagle and saved the day. Yeah, it was really that Russia had a, a big impact on uh, keeping the pressure on mm. uh, both Germany and Japan. Was it Japan? I'm not sure. Yeah, but they definitely were a big uh, world power, mm -hmm. and when they were in the field of game, you know they were a, a, a huge thing to worry about because, you know, no country. I think nobody in history has ever successfully conquered Russia. Is that correct to say? Uh... Like Napoleon tried it, he failed. Germany tried it. Uh, Hitler tried it. He failed, and there were multiple. I think. The only people to succeed were the Mongols. Yeah, Is that true? I'm not sure. Was it the Mongols? I'm gonna, I'm gonna look that up right now. If I uh, remember, yeah, they're they're a nation to not uh, take lightly because their their winters are crazy, mm -hmm. and pl plus the men, it, just the biological. Looking at the bio, uh, yeah. they got some pretty nasty men <laughs> in Russia. Have you seen like a an average guy from Russia? They're pretty. Disgusting. They're pretty alpha. They're pretty manly. Yeah. Oh yeah. Wait. So so wait. You're saying they're disgusting or they're manly? Uh, both. Most. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, not not all of them, but okay. on on the average throughout history, back yeah. in the day when they were uh pretty scary, you know. Right. It's it's it was kind of scary to uh 
Yeah, here we go. Uh, Mongol invasion of Kiavar Ross. Is that how you say it? Okay. Um, invasion of Europe. Uh, they invaded that place, Voldemort. Uh, okay, it looks like they did. I think they did successfully conquer it. Okay. Yeah, cool. I, I've I've heard jokes of like Russian men looking like toads. No offense if you're Russian and you're looking like and you're <laughs> listening to this, but <laughs> I, I, that's please just, don't kill us. <laughs> this was in um, like some movies, right? Um, there was one called oh, yeah. Red Sparrow, I think. Uh, whatever. Anyways, that was a joke. But um, Red Sparrow. Huh? Yeah. Now going back to the whole Japan thing, where so they knew that it was going to be better to surrender to the U.S. and the U.S. was thinking, okay, should we invade um, and just make them surrender by invasion? Or should we show them a little bit of muscle power and flex our nuclear arsenal and show the world that we're not to be messed with? And they decided to go with option number two, which is the nukes. Um, and it's funny because they actually chose uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki because... They were both undamaged cities at the time. They they didn't have they were not war torn cities in Japan. Other cities they didn't choose because those were already damaged, and they wanted to show the world and Japan the might of a nuclear weapon on an undamaged city to see the full potential of the damage. Um, oh wow! So kind of crazy, but hey, I mean that was to save many lives of American people. And they did give them a warning shot. It was one drop, one bomb was dropped first. Then they were like, "Hey, you gotta the, surrender." The biggest of all warning shots, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it was like, "Nope, not gonna surrender." And then I guess they had to drop another one. But crazy, yeah. No joke, no joke. Honestly, people. So I think there was an initial plan to actually invade. Uh, I think one of the biggest cities, Tokyo, or something like that. Some some city in Japan where there was this huge task. Uh, operation that you know the u.s is going to come in on um on the shores of japan and they had like this whole campaign laid out they estimated the lives to be like or they estimated the casualties to be around like one million on that's both what sides I heard. yeah that's what i heard so, so so they were like laying out the plan they're like okay this is what we could do uh in terms of the navy the air force and the army so our military yeah and then, um truman i think it was truman yeah he, was. the president of the United States at the time, he said, okay, there's an alternative. And he was presented with uh, the nuclear bomb, the mm-hmm. atom, the atomic bomb, which was named Little Boy. The mm-hmm. first one was named Little Boy. That's what they yep. nicknamed it. Dropped it on uh, Hiroshima. And then the second one was named Fat Man, which yep. was dropped on Nagasaki. Yeah. And the total deaths was like... Uh, a lot. It was like four hundred thousand. Okay. Was so I, I heard a couple different facts. Number one, okay, it was go for it. estimated for at least for Little Boy or on Hiroshima, it was estimated to be around sixty thousand, sixty six thousand. Sorry, um, but then it was. It's also not completely known how many people actually died because the, the radiation. Well, yeah, the radiation and the after effects for sure. That's one thing. But another thing was that. A lot of the people that live there, they don't have all the records that they live there were cremated because, I mean, it's <laughs> the bomb like wiped all the records out. Literally destroyed history. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so those people, it's like we don't even know how many people really existed there. They were incinerated <laughs> because the nuke is so hot. Like if you're near the epicenter, it's not just like third degree burns. It's literally you become... It's it's so instant dude it's a the nuclear wow. fission process which we can get into in a bit um yeah. the actual science behind it that takes a millisecond to happen so it's so quick it's ridiculous and it doesn't actually detonate on ground it detonates like up like somewhere close in the air apparently so yeah yeah um that's crazy to think about because it's it's a a scientific reaction or chemical reaction, where uh, the atom, the atoms essentially in the atomic bombs, they were split. Yeah. So due to that uh, reaction, and a massive amount of energy was released, and this happens so so fast that I think you wouldn't even feel it <laughs> if you were in the radius of danger. 
Yeah, you would just instantly die. (laughs) It would just like like a snap. You would just turn into dust. Yeah, I mean, and not only that, you have a bunch of uh, after effects from an atomic bomb. So you have radiation, and then the wind of uh, the surrounding area can actually push the radiation to a certain area, and then other cities can be affected and other populations, and it ends up being a very catastrophic. day for everybody <laughs> yeah no seriously <laughs> great way to describe it's dark. that Catas- catastrophic <laughs> it's very dark very depressing yeah i mean who's to say that in the future another nuclear bomb will actually be ignited or used but yeah. nowadays there is a ton of backlash when it comes to using these massive weapons um, so like there's a few treaties on the UN board that um, pretty much restricts uh, the use of nuclear bombs and even the manufacturing of them as well. But we know in reality that behind closed doors, you got world power countries or major nations on the world like uh, Russia, the United States, France, Israel, North Korea, China, maybe. So yeah. Everyone's making bombs. There's always bombs available. Yeah. But, you know, uh, is it going <laughs> to lead to World War Three, Or who knows? Who knows, man? It's kind of, it's kind of depressing because it's... We have so much power... Or I think... Let me... I have a website up here. Uh, World Nuclear Weapons Stockpile. So, right here, I'm on this website. They're saying the total nuclear weapons in the United States is... Uh, 14,215 nuclear bombs in Russia. Oh, no, that's the total, sorry. Uh, okay. In USA, it's 6,000. In Russia, it's uh, 6,400. In France, it's 300. China, 280. UK, 215. Pakistan, 150. India, 130. Israel, 80. And North Korea, 20. Yeah. Uh, that's the reported <laughs> stockpile report in the world. And I think that massive increase in production between the US and the Russia was due to the cold war yeah the arms race 50s yeah yeah 60s so that's crazy think about that that's you the u.s and russia have over 90 percent of all the nuclear weapons in the world yeah they kind of stockpiled right they kind of like (laughs) it was economic war pretty much right the cold war and they have all these nuclear weapons just sitting there (laughs) i'm pretty sure most of them were dismantled i think yeah Yeah, i think i read an article on that once okay but you know there are some left over that they just have just in case quote unquote right so it's that's sad to think about because security is such a important thing to have in respect to nations that Russia and the United States will not give up these nuclear weapons. <laughs> right. No. That I mean it's, that makes it's, sense. It's it's I don't know. It's uh did you hear well, how we recently go ahead. Go oh, yeah, I was going to say like an analogy. Um hmm. let's say for example that you and your neighbor get into a fight and you know it's gone on for like a few months and you guys like we're ready to just take it to the next level. Yeah, and let's say that you know one day uh, the cops got involved, and they kind of calmed things down. Secretly on the side, your neighbor and yourself are gonna have like a, uh, a like a small hate for each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and maybe keep a a few of your weapons, uh, you know, of your own on the side. That's yeah. what I think about it, because there's a lot of tension. Oh yeah. No, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Especially on the on the worldwide level, right? There's so many other consequences beyond, you know, I mean, that's a great analogy, but um on the worldwide scale, it's there's even more things to consider too, right? Much more like, at stake. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, it's like a multiplied effect. It's like you're talking especially government systems and that sort of thing, right? So, I mean, back in the days, it was a lot, back in the day, it was a lot more, it was a lot worse, right? Like the, the whole idea of communism and, uh, versus American freedom and that sort of thing. Yeah. It was a battle of ideas back then. It was our government versus your government. It's, it's insane to think that it was just a flexing thing, right? It was an economic race, really. Like no one was really going to use the the weapons. We all know what's going to happen. You know what? What would happen if all if we had a nuclear war? 
What do you think would happen? Oh my, what would that look like? Oh my god! I mean, I think uh, between every nation, they would just go off left and right. So they would target major cities, uh, wiping out most of the population, most of the uh, vile economic uh, cities in each yeah. nation. So for the United States, I think multiple nations would target, you know, New York, Los Angeles, uh, right. Houston, Texas. Dude, that means we'd and... be screwed. Or I mean, if and maybe not you, because you're up in Merced, but I would, <laughs> I would be screwed from the radiation, oh, okay. man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, all the cities are wiped out. I mean, it's it's scary to think about because that could be a reality. And there was this huge scare during the Cold War that um, I think they would actually advertise uh, buying your own bunker or, or getting your own uh, underground safe haven. Yeah, um, which apparently actually worked. Hole. Those worked. They tested them out. Yeah, they because they, they were made of oh, yeah. made of material sure to yeah. like block out nuclear, you know, whatever it is, like the radiation and whatever. And they would have instructions on how to get rid of all the radiation. So, for example, if you had some in your hair, they tell you don't use shampoo. You have to comb your hair, comb off the the radiation essentially. Because if you if you shampoo your hair, all the particles are gonna get entangled within your hair, and it's gonna make it worse. And like these little tips on how to essentially get rid of the tricks. radiation and to yeah. stay inside and have a stockpile of like food and things like that until the radiation at least disappears for the most part. Um, yeah, yeah, they were all aboard. I mean, when it came to those fallout shelters, I think even the federal government uh, <laughs> did they did they actually promote uh, fallout shelters i'm not too sure um, i have no idea but i know there's a website here, um yeah i'm actually i'm actually on one right now united oh, okay. states history it says okay. here the eisenhower administration distributed information to educate americans about how they could protect themselves survival literature was written primarily for a sub uh suburban audience since it was assumed that cities would be targets and most urban dwellers would not survive so oh, officials God. at the FCDA stated that if people were educated and prepared for a nuclear attack, they could survive an atomic bomb and avoid wholesale death and destruction that occurred at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So I think they actually did educate the, the, the population mass um, in yeah, yeah. the 60s, it looks like, like like 1950s, 1960s. Um, it says here some uh, prototypes were built in Los Altos, California. And they were constructed in 1962, and there was the small facilities from 25 by 48 feet. Um, they could fit at least 96 people, or at most 96 people. Um, yeah, I mean, canned food, canned water, yeah, this whole the whole shebang. Everything was Geiger counters. They had all the yeah, all the equipments here. Jeez, that's scary. I mean, yep. <laughs> like I've, I've yeah. heard of fallout shelters when it comes to like people who live in. Uh, the south, like the flat area where a lot of tornadoes happen. You ever heard of those? Like the common yeah, tornado they shelters? Yeah, have like basements. Yeah. Yeah, that's a common thing down there because tornadoes are running amok. Yeah. But yeah. I would rather be in a tornado actually, than a nuclear. To be honest, yeah, I was just thinking that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would rather be in a tornado situation because at yeah. least you can survive. Right? Yeah. You can come back out. So, I mean, no, no one can really... Uh, at least I can't. Mm. I can't really predict what I would do in that kind of situation. Like if I were to actually live in a time where nuclear bombs actually were ignited or actually hit major cities, and I have to be, I have to spend the rest of my life possibly in a fallout shelter due to the radiation. What would you be like? How so would you, how would you imagine that? Yeah. No. Okay. So let's take this logically, right? So. It depends on it. one where you live and how far away from the epicenter you are, right? So let's say, for example, we're 30 miles away from the epicenter, okay? Sure. Uh, sure. So there's a bunch of radiation you have to survive somehow, okay? My first initial thing would be, um, number one, I have to look up all the information I possibly can on how to stay safe and relay that to friends and family. Uh, and I'm going to immediately set up... You know, I'm assuming electricity is still going to work, you know, and electronics systems are still working, you know, and that sort of thing. So, okay, I would set up a chat where we can all get together 
uh, families and, you know, of the friends and the family, you know, if that's, you know, possible, I guess, or whatever it is, but we can all sort of help each other out, keep each other company and immediately find some way to get shelter, some way to get canned food and prepare just like, I don't know how to explain it, but it would be hardcore, like immediate information seeking and immediate action on safety. We need to get safe. That's it. Pri like the priority. Forget everything else, you know. Um, and so what I'd probably end up doing is uh, I would think about, you know, water supply, food supply, and then yeah. end up, you know, I mean, I'm sure at that point, <laughs> like, who's going to have nuclear uh, shelters, you know, or whatever the fallouts. Yeah, I think the idea is to get away from the radiation as much as possible. So this could be a mass exodus of people moving yeah. from one area to another and that's going to cause a lot of mayhem that's going to cause a lot of traffic uh, issues a lot of tension as if so traffic be... wasn't already bad enough in la <laughs> I, I know right in la it's going to cause the <laughs> most traffic situation ever so yeah it's literally the apocalypse at that point yeah i would think so you got to be in survival mode you got you got to literally think uh that you know this is it. This is kind of the end. So you have to do what you can. Yeah. Um, it's it's a scary thing to think about. So what I would think would happen logically is let's say a nuke hit LA and everyone's trying to get away from the radiation. And everyone's trying to, you know, scatter and, and get to safety. Mm. Uh, for one, cell phone towers would be knocked out, I would assume. Okay. I think most of those would be would be just destroyed. So uh, communication through cellular phones would be completely wiped out. And I had a teacher in, in high school who always uh, was one of those guys that uh, encouraged uh, prepar like preparation for natural disasters. Yeah. And the one thing he always told me in the class was the first thing to go was the cellular towers. The cellular towers, which provided uh, cell phone service to most of of. Uh, customers, most of the providers. Mm -hmm. uh, he says those go first uh, because those are the most sensitive and at the same time, those are the most high maintenance. So right. when it comes to a natural disaster, um, the, 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 I think the facilities are in the city are going to prioritize uh, certain utilities. So they're going to prioritize water. They're going to prioritize um, you know, um, emergency uh, groups or that they, they can send people out to help. So this could be a lot of chaos. And with that in mind, with the cell phone towers out, uh, the one thing, the next thing to do is to, uh, what's the next thing to do? I forgot what he said. He had a, like a, a 10 point plan. <laughs> he was yeah. really legit. He was really hardcore. Um, you know, he, things I remember him saying were like, be prepared, always have like a three days, uh, at least a three days, um, you know, Supply ration ready. of food and water supplies and ready just to go. Um, he was really into like buying uh, these kits, you know, mm. that you see on like Alex Jones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you got like your flashlight, you got your rations, you've got your knife, <laughs> oh, man. just everything ready to go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, anything goes because it's just, you, you don't know how people would act and you don't know what's going to happen next. So always being prepared. That's kind of like the motto. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's hard to, to think about it logically because so many things can happen. I mean, what I would do is get out of there as soon as possible. Get out of the city area. Yeah. Grab your family and go. You know, it's crazy because what I found out was if even, I think it was 0.03% of the world's nuclear arsenal was unleashed, you know, during a war, 0.03%. Okay, there would be so much dust and so many particles in the air that sunlight would be blocked off and the temperature would actually drop by 22 degrees Celsius and we would go into mass extinction for the most part. You know, it's kind of like uh, the whole theory behind the extinction of the dinosaurs was an asteroid came right, uh, hit the planet and just tons of debris and uh, particles were shot up into the air, which spread out and blocked off sunlight and therefore made a lot of, you know, a lot of negative side effects happened 
Um, but they say that they call it a nuclear winter and that nuclear winter would last that drop of, of 22 degrees Celsius would last for about six years. Uh, if 0.03% of the, you know, world's nuclear arsenal was, um, blown up or oh, detonated, wow. you know? So yeah. it's insane to think about, but I mean, 22 degree drop in, in Celsius, by the way, not Fahrenheit. Yeah. Um, Celsius. <laughs> Most in, Americans can't understand Celsius. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Um, but that would be <laughs> insane. Why would it decrease the temperature? I mean, it's a massive amount of energy that's released into the air, right? Wouldn't right. it increase? You would think so, but that's a very temporary increase. That's and, and you're right, actually. The the when on detonation, it's actually around ten thousand degrees Fahrenheit. And okay. when it's when it's detonating, it's there. It's it's even hotter than the surface of the sun. But I it's only that, yeah. It's like a piece it, of the sun being ignited, yeah. Exactly, exactly. But that's only there for a while. And you know, after a certain amount of time it just it dissipates actually pretty quickly. Um, but if you look at it in the long term, it's again like the whole the the, the amount of dust and particles and, and debris that would just go into the air would uh, massively mass. It would cause such a thick layer, uh, you know, I guess in the stratosphere of the Earth or whatever layer of the Earth that sunlight just wouldn't reach through. Oh my! God. It's kind of like. It's like you know. I don't know if you get. I don't know. I don't know if you know this. So Mercury, the planet Mercury, is actually not as hot as Venus. Venus is actually farther away from the sun, but Venus is hotter. And the reason that is is because of all the greenhouse gases, the super thick layer of greenhouse gases that's actually in uh, within the atmosphere, and that causes all the heat to get trapped. It's kind of like that, you know. But think about it oh, wow. in the opposite way here where it's like there's just so much debris that it actually blocks off sunlight and warmth and all this stuff. And I mean, it's not going to drop immediately, the temperature, but it, give it some time. And in the long term, it's going to drop by around 22 degrees Celsius. That's scary. Yeah. That really is. Yeah. The whole climate would change. Big time. It's it's literally the apocalypse of, of the world. It's just yeah the power behind these bombs and the power behind the science. It's it's so massive mm -hmm. that people I don't think they really understand. <laughs> yeah, no, that's why we're just here. what we can do now because it's just um, we have the H bomb now, right? Which is a thousand times more powerful yep. than an atomic bomb. Yep. And uh, I found this website. It's called nukemap.com. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll send it to you right now. <laughs> okay. I think it's appropriate to bring this up. Uh, it gives you simulations of just how uh, powerful a nuclear bomb is, and it, it will give you estimated uh, fatalities and estimated injuries based on um, the type of bomb used. So here I can, I can enter a, a, a bomb uh, simulation-wise. Uh, the first H bomb, which is nicknamed the Ivy Mike, and you can click your destination, <laughs> or you can click it, you can click your uh, uh, specific city. Yeah, and you can Looks go like, to, like LA, LA yeah. or yeah, <laughs> LA. So if I if I detonate this bomb in LA, <laughs> oh my god, which I am which I'm doing now. Oh um, my god, I'm fucking terrified. <laughs> the estimated fatalities is two million three hundred twenty thousand four hundred sixty people. And the injuries is about the same. Um, so you have four, you have four million people being affected, and then uh, over time you can change the direction of the wind right here. And okay. I'm looking at the map right here, and uh, I can change the direction of the radiation due to the wind, and I can pretty much cover the entire Southern California due to the H bomb being dropped in the middle of Los Angeles, and this this uh, cloud. Uh, is so large that it covers into Mexico, it goes over San Diego, it goes through Tijuana, and it literally goes to, uh, what's this place here? San Felipe. I don't know where, I don't know, I don't know where you know that's at, but mm. it's kind of down the ways of Mexico. So, the amount of area is huge. Right. Um, so... That's that. So uh, I the got H bomb. Oh. That's a hydrogen bomb, correct? Hydrogen bomb. 
And yes. I'm assuming the difference is that in an atomic bomb, you have nuclear fission powering the bomb versus <laughs> nuclear fusion powering the hydrogen bomb, correct? Way to drop your knowledge there. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's. <laughs> I've read about that too, to be honest, where yeah. uh, some terms to be familiar with, uh, fission in the science terms, it's the break apart of, of certain atoms. So it's it's the pretty much the deconstruction of, of all these uh, particular elements that we're using. So, for example, in, in the atomic bombs, fission was used to uh, create a massive amount of energy. So the mechanics behind the atomic bomb were they created this uh, circular area of, of uh, certain atoms, and these were considered uh, uranium-235, I think, or something like that. Mm-hmm. They would add this spherical area called the subcritical um okay and they would keep that divided within the bomb so that when they combine them the reactions would occur and the atomic bomb would ultimately ignite and ultimately explode but the process behind fission is that you pretty much shoot a hydrogen uh atom i think at uranium and then once that encounters it causes a uh, a reaction and it pretty much splits off and it pretty much decreases the amount of atomic mass within uranium where it turns into something else. And then this process happens over and over and over again within yeah, like a chain millionth reaction. of a second. Yeah. Yeah. A millisecond. Yeah. So it happens really quick. And that, that cause that chain reaction causes so much energy uh, from each reaction where it ultimately just causes a huge amount of energy to be released. And yeah. Yeah, and the fusion works the same, does it? I'm not too familiar with so, that. So here's what I know. Okay, so if we go a little bit deeper into the atoms, right? So in nuclear fission, which is uh, the decay, you know, I guess the splitting of atoms like uranium, plutonium, that sort of thing, right? Uh, so you, you get enriched uranium, you know, you shoot, like you were saying, I think it was, a, I thought it was a neutron um, particle, but it subparticle, but it could be... Um, hydrogen uh, i think it is a neutron to be honest okay yeah so you uh, from what i remember is you shoot one into one atom right and that atom splits apart because it i guess it hits right and the atom is already kind of weak and so that splits into two or three or multiple parts right then neutrons from that atom will you know fly in all directions they'll hit other atoms and those atoms will break apart, and the, each of those atoms will re- will release more neutrons, um, which will again, you know, it's gonna uh, keep going in a chain reaction. And essentially, you know, this this process is called nuclear fission, where you break apart the atoms, like you like you were saying, essentially, a ton of energy is released, right? Nuclear fusion is essentially you go to the opposite end of the uh, periodic table. So you have elements like hydrogen. This is why they call it the hydrogen bomb. Instead of fission where you break apart the atom, it's fusion where you combine the atoms. And this is actually the process that goes on in the center of the sun that causes the sun to have, you know, heat and release all that heat. Um, Obviously, it takes like 10,000 years, I think, to travel for light to travel from the center of the sun where it's fused through, you know, hydrogen and helium and everything. Um to get to the surface of the sun uh but um overall this is you know the power of the sun essentially you know remember how like in spider-man 2 it was like the power of the sun in the palm of my hand that sort of thing right yeah (laughs) so it's basically that's the idea is that you're fusing these atoms and but it gets so there's so much energy released and actually you need to have a decent amount of energy to begin with to actually fuse these atoms because it's a lot harder to fuse the atoms um i think you have to fuse two hydrogen atoms to create a helium one if i'm not incorrect um and to fuse them it takes a lot of energy to begin with uh to split you know uranium i don't think it takes as much energy so um but it turns out when you do fuse these atoms together so much even more energy is released this is this is exactly why the hydrogen bomb is actually um more powerful than a regular atomic bomb so you fuse the atoms together and this is exactly the power of the sun and 
boom that's what that's literally a hydrogen bomb yeah that's the science behind it i think uh in the details of it i remember watching a video the the combination of four hydrogen atoms is a helium atom i think okay you're probably yeah, yeah you're right you're right it is four it is four yes you're yeah, right so if, if it's four then um a strange occurrence happens where the four hydrogen atoms if you if you weigh them like on a scale like a, on a physical scale for for argument's sake the four atoms uh is going to be i think heavier than the helium atom so it's kind of weird i okay. think uh they're pointing this out in the video where uh the helium atom is just four hydrogen atoms right mm -hmm. so it's essentially the same thing but they weigh differently so the fact that they're weighed differently means that there's some type of energy transfer or some type of energy difference between the two. Okay. Um, and I think that's the idea behind the fusion aspect where uh, where you combine atoms, essentially, uh, like in fusion. Yeah. Um, the, the amount of energy is going to be released from each combination or each mixture of atoms. Yeah. Uh, so multiply that by like a million within like half a second or even less yeah. uh, that amount of energy is going to exponentially grow yeah and the the final reaction is a big boom yeah you know it's crazy because what i heard was the largest nuke exploded in history i'm pretty sure you you found this somewhere in your research also did you the czar bomba i don't the czar bomba i don't think so actually Oops. i didn't look that up Okay, sorry, my Siri kind of went off right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, no. So the Tsar Bomba was the largest nuclear weapon detonated by the Soviet, not just the Soviet Union, the world, but it was, it just happened to be the Soviets who had detonated it. Uh, and it was a practice bomb. Um, it's, you're going to be a little shocked at this. It was 1,400 times more powerful then the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki combined. Oh, I, yeah, I have it here on the nukemap.com. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. We can, we can see the power of this bad boy. <laughs> yeah, it was insane. Yeah, it's saying here it's the largest, um, well, it's the largest USSR bomb tested, but you're telling me it's the largest bomb tested in general? It, that's what I've heard, yes, in that's general. What heard, okay. So if we drop this guy on New York, for example, yeah. Let's see here. Uh, we got a total of oh my god, that number just keeps increasing. Seven million <laughs> six hundred thirty-three thousand three hundred ninety hundred. Uh, am I saying that correctly? But roughly seven point six million uh, fatalities, and then four point two million injuries. Wow. And the radius of this guy is huge. Oh my god. So uh, the effect radius for this guy is roughly uh 3.14 kilometers um so it's going to be 30 31 kilometers squared and i don't know what that is in <laughs> in imperial units and american units right uh fireball radius 67.1 kilometers squared uh air blast radius uh 249 kilometers squared and then um everything else it's it's pretty much engulfing uh, Long Island. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. The whole freaking thing. You know, it's funny because somewhere in some documentary, I saw that the, the pilot who dropped that bomb um, actually felt his airplane shake like crazy. And he actually was very closely caught in uh, uh this he almost this, went down yeah he almost went down and so he quit the air force after that or the the russian air force <laughs> or whatever Screw this. Yeah, <laughs> he's like too. i'm not i'm not down for this anymore man um, i wouldn't do it in the first place yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but can you imagine being in that airplane and seeing something like that oh Jeez. my god it actually Seriously? created a super massive crater that's still there today and that whole area is actually abandoned is it let me let me find that out yeah they they say Jeez. windows in Finland were shaking. Oh my god! In Finland, I'm looking at it right now. In Finland, where was it uh, tested? Somewhere, I think in uh, I don't know. To be honest, I, I I don't really know the the place, but somewhere, somewhere in, in the Soviet Union, Some... somewhere near it. Yeah. Okay. Wow. I mean, geez, 
if you were a pilot, you would have like huge remorse. You would have like a a bunch of like morality issues going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because it's just like I'm just a messenger, man. <laughs> yeah, seriously. I just I'm just trying to send a thing. message here. I'm not trying to kill a ton of people. <laughs> it wasn't me. It was my yeah. boss. <laughs> Can you imagine being the captain or the the person who flew the bombs to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Enola Gay, which is the airplane? I know, yeah. And you're you're told that okay, we have a new weapon, uh, just drop it. And you're like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I'm just on, sure. on a mission, man. I didn't know I was gonna yeah. kill hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they didn't tell the pilots. To be honest, they didn't Probably tell them like not. what kind of bomb it was. They were just like, okay. Uh, normal air raid or or normal uh, bombing raid over Japan, and yeah, they're like, okay, yeah. sure. Um, they were probably told it was like a special type of bomb, mm. um, but they probably didn't think anything of it. To be honest, I'm pretty sure they saw the result of it. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> afterwards, oh, yeah. <laughs> like look, they look back out the cockpit. They're like, oh wow, <laughs> <laughs> I can see it all that. the way from up here. <laughs> we almost got hit. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. It's it's kind of sad. It really is. No, really. You know, they dropped a bunch of... In, there was another plane following the Enola Gay. It actually dropped a bunch of instruments along with uh, the atomic bomb to measure certain things like... Uh, this, to measure the damage, essentially. To measure the uh, the heat and that sort of thing. To help oh, engineers wow. to, you know, I guess, get stats on it. Get stats on it, yeah. I mean, yeah. with a thing like that, you have to measure it in- intensely. Oh, and, yeah. Oh, wow. 1961 was when the Tazar bomb was dropped. 50 yeah. megatons. 50 megatons? Is that what it said? Is that what your research said? That's, that's what it says Ooh. here. Wait, wait. How many megatons? 50. 50 megatons? That's what it's saying, yeah what okay okay so check this out okay according to my research the largest nuclear weapon in the u.s arsenal currently has a yield of 1.2 megatons which is 1,200,000 tons of tnt okay how does that make <laughs> sense 50 so you're saying so sar the sar bomba was almost 50 times or the Tsar bomb, or whatever the hell I I, I found what the based on my yeah. research yeah. it was the Tsar bomb, <laughs> but yeah, wow. that's what it says here: fifty megatons. And I got a little graph here showing uh, how big the cloud was. The cloud was estimated to be, uh, what is that? Two million feet? Is that what it is? No, twenty thousand feet. <laughs> I was gonna say, is it two million added, feet added like, a in couple. space? <laughs> <laughs> it's touching the. <laughs> it's close to the moon. <laughs> oh my god! Two hundred thousand feet. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, compared to the Nagasaki and Hiroshima uh, cloud height, which was twenty thousand feet, and the uh, altitude of a commercial airliner is around forty thousand feet. Yeah, that's insane. It's a big cloud yeah it's a huge cloud yeah the uh little boy which was dropped in hiroshima was only fifteen thousand yeah. tons or 15 kilotons <laughs> this is fifteen thousand versus 50 what is it million Megaton. yeah fi- yeah 50 million tons yep Jeez, that's what it is yeah we can i think we can get larger <laughs> i think we can make it bigger oh i'm sure i'm sure man <laughs> we just gotta get a, a ton of new tech and uh we gotta <laughs> <laughs> i'm pretty sure that you know going off the rails here aliens have seen this and they're like oh fuck <laughs> yeah look yeah. what they're doing to their own planet they're they're bomb them they're bombing themselves yeah that'll be so dumb they'll be <laughs> really dumb really look at would these be. look at these guys they're so dumb <laughs> that's why we never visit them <laughs> that's scary to think about i mean has science gone too far folks <laughs> <laughs> to be honest do you think I science like has gone too have. far okay but i feel like it was inevitable you know if if tech remember, remember how we talked about in the firearms episode how technology it just because human beings always have to be better than one another in terms of like 
warfare, you know? So warfare has evolved in a, in a way where, you know, firearms had to get better and better and the losers of war would have to get better tech. And then, you know, if the tech was achieved, then, you know, the people had, had to essentially get better and better tech. Um, and so eventually it led to the creation of the nukes had to get and be- better and better. Yeah. I think, I think we've gotten to the point where it doesn't even matter anymore, dude. Like, what are you going to do? You're going to blow up a ton of nukes at this point. You can't get, what's the point of getting better at technology, right? I mean, I guess, I guess there is a point, right? I guess essentially to avoid nu- the use of nuclear weapons, you can, you know, uh, invest into like drone technology and all this kind of stuff but overall like i don't see the point unless you're going up against aliens like what's the point of getting bigger than a hydrogen bomb you know <laughs> yeah i mean let's let's talk about that going yeah. against aliens would we literally just like send a nuke up there and be like look at what we got don't mess with us <laughs> Um, I think we would have to do so, so, so much thorough analysis about what, you know, the aliens are, are, their intentions are, what their capabilities are. Can they literally obliterate us if we, you know, if we start a war? (laughs) Um, (laughs) Yeah. uh, Do we have no choice but to fight back? Because if we don't, they're going to exterminate us. Um, In which case, you know... Uh, wars with bad odds have been won right like think about the revolutionary war the americans had massive disadvantages in terms of numbers and tech Uh, they had other advantages but overall they had disadvantages and they used uh their heads right to uh, guerrilla warfare and all that kind of stuff and they won i don't think we can in my opinion, we can't really apply a lot of history when it comes to aliens because when we do meet aliens, uh-huh. it's gonna just we're gonna lose our shit. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> we're talking about a non human thing that's actually interacting with us, um yeah. that has never before in history. And actually to be honest, um my theory I think I've told you this before, uh my theory is that we're never gonna really meet aliens uh in the in the near future. Like maybe Within the next, I don't know, few thousand years, we're not really going to meet aliens. We're going to meet um, some type of AI, I think. So I think the idea behind space exploration is uh, you have advanced civilizations throughout the galaxy or throughout the universe. Um, And if these civilizations have like um, mortal beings, like us, like human beings, uh, we have a lifespan of like 100 years at most, right? So... Sending someone across the galaxy or, or across solar systems to co-communicate with other civilizations, that's not really going to be feasible mm. unless we can, unless we, you know, uh, take some advice from the movies and freeze ourselves and do cryo sleep and transport <laughs> ourselves in that way. But yeah. I think the most effective way is to actually create some type of complex AI, some artificial intelligence, mm. to actually do the exploring for us. Okay. And I think other civilizations are to figure that out too, where they're like, okay, we'll just send this super smart computer out and communicate for us, right? And we'll see what happens there. Um, so I think that's what's going to happen. We're going to ultimately encounter some type of either some message or some uh, automated vessel, <laughs> right? You know what I mean? Yeah, no, that's my definitely. theory behind it. Um, uh, have you seen the movie Oblivion? Oblivion. Uh, Tom Cruise. See, oh yeah, uh, where he it's uh, him and this girl, and they're like, yeah, they're duplicated. Yeah, spoiler. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got it now, right? Uh, uh, another spoiler alert. Uh, the guy he finds out, you know, the whole thing. They're aliens and everything like that. He goes up into the spaceship, um, has a nuke with him actually, and detonates the center of the ship. And that like destroys everything else, you know. Yeah, yeah. Sci-fi movie. It was a good movie. Yeah. I liked it. Yeah. Uh, the power of nukes. <laughs> power of nukes. <laughs> Title of today's episode: The Power of Nukes. Yeah. It's uh, yeah, nuclear destruction, nuclear. Oh my god! So 
you have nations today like North Korea flexing the amount of nukes they have, right? Or the amount of nukes that they can actually ignite. Yeah. Um, do you think that North Korea will ultimately uh, set off the next nuke? <laughs> I don't or think so, next... dude. No? I really don't think Not so. Really. Um, I, I would be scared, and I was scared at one point. I was thinking about it. I'm like, really? Are they going to do that? Are they that stupid? But to be honest, I don't think so because... I think Kim Jong Un knows and understands how 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 radically incapable his country is and how deprived of economic resources his country is compared to the world <laughs> or even any other country really uh, like the US. I mean I think North Korea is one of uh, it's at the bottom of the list almost in terms of economic resources, right? To you were first of all let's say you do obtain nuclear technology you are only going to be able to make a few nukes at most um and if anything we're going to send in some sort of tom cruise like character to dismantle those you know on some secret cia mission or whatever (laughs) literally Um, tom cruise yeah (laughs) imagine uh like mission impossible (laughs) but i'd watch that (laughs) i know right um but I mean, here's the thing too, right? I think that you have to really think about that. And I, I don't think Kim Jong-un is that dumb. I don't think he really is, you know, so incapable of understanding that his country will be blown off the face of the planet if he starts a war. Not only that, his not only his own life, his whole legacy, you know, his uh, the whole country will just be wiped out. Um, or at least some sort of repercussion is going to be there that's going to cripple them even more than they already are. Uh, so to be honest, I don't think it's going to happen, but uh, it, it is good to prepare for this. Do you think, my question to you was actually going to be this a while ago, but it kind of dropped out of my mind. Uh, do you think the U.S. or any other country has technology currently to prevent a nuclear detonation from a different country? Like, for example, so. yeah, I would say so also. I think so also. Yeah. I think they've invested into some sort of tech where they can see, okay, let's say like, okay, nuclear weapon is heading towards our way. It's going to hit New York City in 10 minutes, let's say, right? Um, I would say the tech that they probably have is, okay, we can see that this nuke is headed towards New York. Okay. What do we do from this point on, right? We can, um, I guess I think one of the tech they might have is to blow it up in the air so it causes Hold on the missile yeah yeah like electromagnetic radiation right where it'll maybe cause some sort of uh electrical um like outage i guess uh like a mass whatever so you're saying you want to dismantle the bomb by taking away the electricity is that what you're trying to say no 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 i'm saying i'm saying they'll probably blow the bomb up before it reaches the, the target, land yeah. yeah yeah the target essentially right and if it's close enough in the air and you blow it up there the electromagnetic in the radiation or what is it called emp electromagnetic pulse i think that's what it is where you know if you blow it up in the middle of the air it sends shock waves or whatever it is electromagnetic pulse outwards and that causes mass electronic systems to shut down essentially um but that would be the downside right now, I guess that could be a major disadvantage, but I'm sure they also have preparation for that also, you know, where it's like, okay, we got backup electric systems here. We have things to, in, in case this happens, like uh, pen, the Pentagon has, you know, backup uh, sources of power. Okay. So I'm sure they're prepared. Um, I'm, I would not be shocked at all if they had prepared for the worst case scenario, you know? Right. So yeah, the science behind that. What is the protocol actually? The protocol is actually, um, if a, a nuclear weapon was to reach the United States in any way, um, I think one, the first responders would be the Air Force. Okay. So, uh, what kind of protocol did they have? I'm trying to look up online, like if there's an actual protocol, but I don't think they're gonna uh, reveal that to the public knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but. Um, I mean, one thing would be to what you were saying, uh, 
pretty much uh, target the missile that's carrying the nuke with mm -hmm. another missile so you can collide those two projectiles and just ignite the atomic bomb mid-air. Yeah. Um, that would be a worst-case scenario, I would think, because you still have all that radiation out there uh, to deal yeah. with. Yeah, yeah. Um, second, I think, would to somehow uh, disarm the bomb. Dismantle before, the mechanism just, before... Or dismantle some, the mechanism, right? There's got to be some way. There's got to be some way. Either by drone or, or by some sort of what you were saying, uh, EMP or some magnetic force that could actually disrupt the mechanism within the bomb. Yeah, so it doesn't uh, blow up. So it doesn't ignite, yeah. So you can disrupt the, the reaction that would occur. Another theory would be to actually attach another uh, thruster onto the bomb and launch it into space. <laughs> <laughs> Are you getting this idea from the Avengers? <laughs> the first one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Iron Tony Man. Tony Stark style. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> First, you have to open up a portal in space and then <laughs> knock it through there. Hey, man, we just discovered it... the first black hole. So we we have actual, <laughs> we're getting there, man. We're getting there. <laughs> yeah, everyone's talking about that. It's nonstop. People are talking about it. I was talking to my math professor about it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. He was what like, have to say, it's, it's, she? he's like, it's not that color. Like, it doesn't give off visible light. <laughs> I'm like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he was doing, he was going into the specifics, and we were talking about that. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, so recent news: uh, the black, the first ever black hole was captured uh, on, I think, on a camera from one of the telescopes on Earth. Yeah. Uh, I, I thought it was taken from a satellite, but apparently no, no, no. it was from. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. It was apparently on Earth, right? Yeah, I think so. One of the telescopes we have here. Yeah. Um, you would assume it would be a yeah. satellite. <laughs> I assume because it's so far away. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I mean, big discovery. Everyone's talking about it. There's a bunch of memes about it. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's it's nothing exciting, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> it is for the scientific community, but if you look at the image, it's just it's not much. It's exactly what you would think a black hole would look like. Right, right. It's just a circular uh, black hole. Yeah. <laughs> How else can you describe it? How else can you describe it? Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, it doesn't look too special, but these things are... They literally create planets, don't they? Is that the science behind it? Wait, say that again? Do they... Cr uh, black holes, do they create planets? Do they create galaxies? solar systems um i'm not too sure about that but i know there are certain i think every at the center of every galaxy is a massive black hole um and it's just sucking in the light i guess for uh, around it now people say that there's all sorts of weird theories out there about what happens when you go into a black hole um but i don't think they create planets um or at least not from what i know uh, there are theories out there where if you go into a black hole, we should have an episode on black holes. We should do some research on Good that. Good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Let's we'll start um, right now. <laughs> imagine midway. <laughs> Forget nukes, man. <laughs> <laughs> this is where the real stuff is at. Yeah. This is the, I don't know much this about This is them. the real weapon of mass destruction. <laughs> <laughs> this is the ultimate one. Forget nukes. <laughs> we can harness this baby. <laughs> we'll be the, the dominant species of, of the hole. entire universe. <laughs> We're going to take over the whole galaxy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know much about them, to be honest. All I know is that they're big and that light doesn't escape them. Yeah, yeah. It's so powerful, the force that that just uh, takes it in. But from what I've heard, there's multiple theories, right? There's one where you go into the black hole and you sort of almost turn into like a spaghetti string-like material. Your whole body just becomes dismantled. Uh, because of the high amount of pressure, you know, in in the in the hole, and so um, there's other theories where if you go in, it will bend. It, the whole concept behind space is like you can bend certain parts of space and instantly transport yourself from one end or one part of the universe to another part. Yeah, um, it's like a wormhole, right? Where you can actually uh... yeah take it as like a as a gate to like another galaxy or something like that or like it yeah it sends you to like another area yeah that's kind of weird yeah 
But apparently that that theory is yeah. very plausible too because it has it has a lot of scientific theory to back it up. Like it's uh, the whole idea. Imagine like a piece of paper. I think I might have explained this to you. But oh yeah, the classic yeah piece of paper. Yeah, <laughs> right. It's like the classic thing. It's like you can actually instead of traveling all the way across from one end of the paper to the other, you just fold the paper in half, poke a hole right there, and you're already there. You know, <laughs> it's like. Yeah, isn't that the theory behind hyperspace? <laughs> oh, I have no idea, to and be like, honest. And like Star Wars and Star Trek? Oh, you don't watch Star Wars or Star Trek? Okay. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> well, Star Wars, that's I think, not Star Trek. Yeah, that's. I think that's the theory behind it, where it's like they, they harness the power of, of wormholes. Yeah. And, you know, you, you can instantly uh, transport yourself to another galaxy. Um, right, right. I think that's the idea behind that. I mean, the black hole... What's so weird about it is I think um, where they decide to pop up, like they're in random places, and I think no one can really explain why they end up being in that location. Like, why is there a black hole in sector uh, 58B in galaxy FAG or something like that? Like, we don't know. Um, it's it's kind of weird to think about. Right. From what I've, I mean, I, I could be incorrect here. I'm not too much of a pro on this, but I think we are incorrect here. But <laughs> from what I've heard, the black holes used to be uh, stars and they eventually collapse I- into themselves and they turn into neutron, uh, you know, stars or something like that with intense, intense uh, density where they're so they they just have so much mass per uh mass for the size of of uh, for being that size let's put it that way uh speaking of which actually um quickly getting back to nukes uh have you heard of what a neutron bomb is a neutron bomb yeah i have not no so a neutron bomb uh is another type of nuclear weapon okay this one should be most feared Okay, apparently, from what I've heard. Oh, wow. (laughs) Are you ready? It's actually not meant to explode massively and, you know, like a hydrogen bomb or an atomic bomb. It's actually... imploding? No. uh, uh, That would be insane if it imploded, actually. (laughs) Wait, so what's the... (laughs) What is implosion? What exactly is that? Uh, Good question, actually. What I remember um, from, like, my science physics class, where... If you implode, you actually cause like a mini black hole. <laughs> oh my god! Like that. <laughs> oh my... No, I don't think we have the power to create black holes quite yet. <laughs> okay, not yet. It's coming soon. <laughs> Imagine. Tune in next time. Yeah. <laughs> Where we figure out what an implosion really is. <laughs> Scientists on the job, night and day, day and night. Oh, when did Odyssey turn into a science show? <laughs> <laughs> that is that sound that is that kind of sound to it <laughs> yeah um, uh, you were saying something about neutron bombs yes so neutron bombs are they're not meant to explode massively they're meant to explode very they have small explosion radiuses and all that kind of thing right but the idea behind it is that it actually shoots out a lot more radiation they're meant to be small but they release a ton and a ton of radiation and they actually don't do much damage at all to like buildings or anything like that. So the buildings are kept intact. Everything around oh, the city is kept intact, but the people are dying. But, but the people, yeah. Yeah. Um, That's scary. No, none in history have been used, but Saddam Hussein actually claimed that the U.S. once used it against, you know, his people or whatever um, at oh, yeah. the time. Yeah. Now, honestly, I would not be surprised if they did. I'm sure if they have the technology, they're going to... Because, like, who's going to verify whether a neutron bomb went off? Like, are you going to go check the radiation in, you know, in the Middle East or what? Yeah, it's kind of sneaky. It really is sneaky. Yeah. It's probably the Especially sneakiest bomb we part. have. Yeah. <laughs> if we have it. I'm not saying we do. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We probably do. I mean, come on. We're the U.S. <laughs> Someone's... <laughs> <laughs> come on bro we're the u.s we got everything. <laughs> america from triple triple deckered uh cheeseburgers to <laughs> secret bombs to neutron bombs <laughs> from mcdonald's the whole to spectrum neutron bombs. everything in between we got it <laughs> <laughs> obesity to neutron bombs <laughs> america <laughs> quarter pounders to bombs we got it all son <laughs> yeah i mean oh god that, 
to be honest, I wouldn't be surprised if President Trump was like, "All right, we made this new bomb. It it kills <laughs> just people, and it keeps everyone intact, but the people." I'm like, "All right." <laughs> oh my god, I'm not surprised. Oh man, that's kind of scary though, because it's just it is. yeah. You can just drop it anywhere and be like, "Oh, what? How did how did that happen?" Yeah, where did that radiation <laughs> come from? Where did that come from? Oh wow, <laughs> they were doing some kind of tests. <laughs> Bad people. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that will be so bad but yeah neutron no, so bombs neutron bombs yeah um, are there any other bombs that we should be aware of you know <laughs> i'm sure there are but i we not know that i came them. across in my research so far okay yeah um, they're kind of keeping it under the rug out of the pentagon <laughs> i'm assuming you know i'm assuming they have so many different types of bombs um you know they're just waiting to release them when the next war comes around who knows because, like, what excuse would you have to release one and tell the public that you have it, you know? You might as well keep it as secret as possible from the other nations so they don't have the tech or they don't try to develop that tech, you know? Yeah. <laughs> sneaky. Very sneaky. Because mm-hmm. it's... I think... Do you think the most powerful nation is the one who has the biggest guns <laughs> or the better guns? essentially like the most powerful uh, military okay so i would say no but in the in practicality so so in my opinion the most powerful nation would be the one with the most economic resources not the one with okay. the most military might but in practicality america has both we're the number one economy and the number one military <laughs> by far america. so yeah yeah <laughs> so i mean quite honestly like our military is bigger than the next five countries combined uh, or, or we spend five times more or we no, my bad my bad let me let me rephrase that we spend more than the next five countries over, combined than the second fourth third fourth fifth sixth place combined yeah mm-hmm. so uh we spend a lot on military so we we obviously have the biggest military and trump recently just passed a huge spending bill 700 billion dollars that we're going to be spending on the military so it's going to be even more uh strength through peace or peace through strength um, that sort of idea, but it's also for defense, you know, um, but beyond that, no dude, but here's my thing. I think if you have a strong economy that will transfer over to a strong military, at least in some way, shape or form, there's a, not a super strong correlation, but there is a decent correlation there, uh, where if your economy is doing well, your military is probably also doing well because you have the resources to be able to put into military might, um, and, and, you know, research and all that sort of thing. But if your people are starving yeah. and if your country is in, sh- in a shithole, then, yeah, you're going to have to spend time and resources, you know, going after that and fixing that first. Uh, examples that are the opposite of that would be like North Korea and Pakistan, right? These countries are so poor, yet they have uh, – well, one is close to nuclear weapons and the other one has nuclear weapons, Um but I don't know. Overall, military might, it's, I don't think it's the one with the biggest military weapon, but I can't say that for sure because, again, in reality, we have both, you see? Um, and I think America, it's important to have both. I think it's important yeah. to have both. You know, I, 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 I'm not discounting the fact that we need to have a very, very, very strong military compared to the second place, right? Um, it's a sort of, a deterrence strategy right you know you don't want to have a weak military and like a super strong economy because if you can't uh, you can't protect that economy from you know some jealous other country (laughs) who knows what the president of that other country is going to do man so yeah i mean even north korea they're kind of local aren't they (laughs) yeah oh yeah i'm sure (laughs) they're just a a a firecracker they're all over the place it's just They have nuclear weapons. Now they're back up. Now they don't. Oh, guess what? Oh, guess what? We really had them all along. Yeah. It's, yeah, a lot of tension. And I think it's just for attention, to be honest. Yeah, probably. That's pretty much what it is. Yeah. yeah definitely. I mean, are, they, are they really that big of a country? <laughs> no, not North at Korea. all. Really, they don't not really contribute at all. that much. They're land just like wise, in their own world. Yeah. Land wise, people wise, just generally speaking, not a big country. And the and the, the economic system they have is just it's total trash. Like you can't look like, for example, um, with nukes. Right. The uh, this is another fact that I learned about that I never mentioned was 
It was actually a Belgium mining firm that shipped most of the uranium from a piece of land in Africa. Today, it's it's the from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, right? That's where all the uranium for uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki came from, or the majority of it came from. Oh yeah, um, and you know it was shipped over to the U.S. from a Belgian mining like company. Now, if you don't have the resources to mine uranium, you don't even know what the hell. You know, you're so I don't want to say savage. I don't want to go that far, but you're so uh, I don't even want to say primordial, but old, old style, or you know, very closed minded, very closed off. As a nation, economically, you know, intelligence-wise, everything like that, right? How are you going to? You can even have nuclear technology, but if you can't match up to the technology of the U.S. or even any other strong country, it's not even a, a good thing to have a nuke. What's the point? You know, if we can just deter that nuke very easily, if we have tech to, you know, dismantle it, then great. You just lost probably millions of dollars on that nuke that you spent and your country's already poor as hell. How are you going to, you know, it, it just doesn't seem to make sense. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's the bonus for, or that's something you don't have to worry about when you're a dictator. <laughs> <laughs> I guess your people are just going to be forced to work then. Yeah. It's like, all right. Um, I don't care what they feel. Yeah. It's all about getting power. Yeah. Yeah. Common mistake throughout history. But, you know, during the Cold War, I think we should talk about that at length okay. here. We didn't live through the Cold War, and our parents did. Um, yeah. I don't know if your parents talk about it, um, but my parents, they talked about it a few times. Yeah. Uh, how they were, like, afraid that nuclear uh, chaos was imminent or that it could very well be a reality. Mm. And even Jordan Peterson, he said he was obsessed over the Cold War on how it could actually devastate um society as a whole right so you've got a lot of people um throughout history and they're still alive today to be honest um that i remember that remember a time where um nuclear weapons were actually pointed at their faces <laughs> yeah so that's, that's a very scary thing to think about Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have local schools teaching kids how to get out of the desk and you have fallout shelters being uh, being asked for by the Kennedy administration. Mm. And, you know, it, it was such a, a a red scare throughout history. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that Cold War economic war where it was just the arms race of beefing up on military, beefing up on bombs and beefing up on just anything catastrophic. Yeah. Um, do you think we'll ever have that again with a nation? Um, like a Cold War say. type situation? Cold War, yeah, something like that. Uh, I think we're I think we're in that state of mind with China. We're having like this economic war. Yes, it's like very close to it. But now my my contention to that would be, I think China still has a very long way to go before it catches up to the U.S. Um, I know China's, I think, the number two economy in the world right now behind the U.S., but people don't take into consideration that their population is so big that their standard of living is total crap. If you take their GDP per person, meaning per capita, it's trash. It's not any, it's like the 90th it place. literally says trash on the Excel sheets, folks. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, go, go to uh, gdp.org. <laughs> Not even it zero. It's trash it's just next trash. to it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so, it's just bad, you know? Now, here's the thing. It's very possible that we may have a Cold War. We may even be in a Cold War right now, sort dun, of a dun, type dun. situation, <laughs> where the government's not really telling you much about all the secret operations that are going on, um, all the, you know, the American, I don't know, I don't even freaking know, maybe CIA agents have, you know, infiltrated Chinese, the Chinese government to, you know, the FBI, <laughs> or the FBI have been, have gone into, you know, Chinese, uh, the government to take a look at what, you know, tech they have to, uh, I guess, gather information, you know, um, because it's very important, right? Like, how are you going to protect your own country if you don't know what you're going up against? 
but yeah, makes sense. I don't know. I don't know. I it, we might just. I feel like yes, we will probably see a time like that in our future, but it's not going to be as bad as people think. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. Um, I just don't know, dude. If we have another president like Trump in the future, where like it's the guy is just very like hard headed and like has to be like the strong guy in the room, um, th- then you know he has access to the nuclear <laughs> arsenal, right? Um, and I don't know, man. I don't know. I just feel like you have to have a very rational, controlled person as president and you know as whatever whoever's in charge of the nuclear arsenal um do you really think that he's fully in charge of the nuclear arsenal no no definitely not fully in charge probably he does have i think i think from what i know the president does have some sort of authority in the case of when um making a final decision about whether to actually uh go through you know with uh launching a nuke uh but i think it has to go through a few people also like it's not just one person in power that can make that that drastic of a decision right on top of that i think the only case in which the president can immediately react uh or has like five minutes to react or whatever is in the case of when a nuke is headed our way and we have to do something to uh, immediately make a decision and you know we can't just sit there and discuss it so one person has to be the leader and make a decision here about what you're going to do are you going to counter strike are you going to you know what are you going to do that is um, too much pressure to handle <laughs> within <laughs> that five minutes <laughs> i know i don't think trump can handle it <laughs> really interesting i feel like you could yeah. i feel like you could i feel like any well maybe not i don't know we have to it depends right i don't know um who knows, man? That's, Who knows? Yeah. This whole idea throughout history, throughout American history, is uh, that the man upstairs, the, the leader of the free world, has the codes to the nuclear nukes, or to the nuclear nukes. <laughs> to, <laughs> to the nuclear nukes. <laughs> I was going to say weapons, but then nukes. <laughs> yeah. My mind kind of went aloof right there. <laughs> so he has the codes to... Right. The bombs, essentially, um, and you know, it, we the, in movies they have this this scene always where it's like there's a guy with a briefcase that comes along and he he sets it in front of the 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 president at the Oval Office and he yeah. kind of like puts in the code and he opens it and it's like there's like a key that the president has and he turns it. Yeah, um, that's what I imagined it's like, but yeah, it's. I think we're the only nation that actually has that old idea where it's like, okay, the man at the top, the president of the United States has the key to the bombs. Am I right? right. Am I wrong? Um, do I countries think do that as well. That is what, that that's what the, I'm assuming the majority of people think, right? They automatically think the president has all the power of the nuclear arsenal. Which yes. I'm not 100% sure that's true, and I don't even think that would be true. That just doesn't make any logical sense, unless it was under the circumstance of, like I was saying before, where one person has to make a decision extremely quickly, um, and in that case, it might be the president, it might even be someone else, for all we know, from the Pentagon, you know, who has more information than the president. Yeah, um, like some sort of general. Yeah. yeah. Now... I'm assuming that it has to go through a few different people at least before they all decide on a nuclear weapon, you know, launch. And it all has to be done at once. The key codes, each one has a different code, I'm assuming, and they all have to do it at once, right? And, you know, because if one person is like, fuck it, I'm just going to do it, you know, I don't care about the approval of everyone else. So, or, or the, you know, going through everyone else and they just do it. What the hell? Like, you just, you caused war which is no light thing, you know? So I think it has to all be done at once, you know? They all have to kind of sw- turn the key. They have to, like, put in a key, put in the code, and then they turn the key at- all at once, you know what I mean? To launch that, um, to launch the, the missile or whatever. It's a cooperative thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, it, it's such a, uh, a carefully um, executed task that it can't just be up to one person. So, um 
I mean, you're talking about a nuclear bomb, so that can kill millions of people. Yeah. And do we know by any facts? Mm-hmm. Is there always a bomb ready to go? Like I'm sure. at all times? I, I'm okay. sure. Or or if it's not ready to go at all times, I don't think it's gonna take too long to get ready because I feel like especially in the US, that's absolutely critical to have. Because if we're never, I don't think we'll we'll for sure know when a nuke is gonna head our way. We might maybe have some idea, but you know exactly when we don't really know. I mean, you know. But why why would we have a have to have a nuke ready at all times? I mean, in respect to a uh, a counterattack, right? So if a yeah. nuke was headed our way as a target, we wouldn't need a nuke to counteract that nuke. We would just need some type of protocol. At like which we discussed, or whatever. there's some type of missile to counteract that. Yeah, um, no, you're right, you're right. Um, I don't know, to be honest. I just, I, I'm not 100% sure, obviously. But I get the feeling that that is a thing. You know, I think that nukes are, at least we have one that is ready to go. I know that nukes are like planted all over the U.S., dude. Like they're like yeah, somewhere in like sacred. Yeah, yeah, like some of them are like in some Montana. Nevada. Yeah, <laughs> some of them are just like in the, in the most weird random places. places. Yeah. There's like one in Alaska. <laughs> yeah, probably. No, I'm pro- I'm sure there's multiple in Alaska. In the Walmart. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine underground underneath the Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> underneath the Kinkos or the <laughs> or the Wendy's. Oh my god, man. Yeah. And the employees have to handle it, imagine. <laughs> they're like they're, they're secret agents. <laughs> they have the keys. <laughs> Why is there a Wendy's in the middle of nowhere? <laughs> that makes no sense. <laughs> we don't even get any yeah. business out here, man. <laughs> <laughs> there's like no one around here. <laughs> I mean, they, there's got to be some type of secrecy in respect to these these missiles because you know there's going to be that individual in america that's going to try to hack into the system and try to set off the nukes yeah so there's always that fear um and is that even possible is it even possible to hack into the uh (laughs) the nuclear codes and actually set off a bomb Mm. that would be scary who knows? So the FBI agent who was actually listening to this, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the CIA agent, <laughs> the CIA. <laughs> if that is possible, I mean, send us a message. Just one nine or nine. Five two four. He probably already has Comment my information. In the comments below. He doesn't even need, need me to say it. <laughs> we get a phone call right now. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of scary. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm pretty sure that's been tried in the past. Yeah. Um. Or there's been some sort of hacker that's attempted oh, to yeah. find the location of a nuclear bomb. Multiple um, times, I'm sure. Multiple times, yeah. It, I mean, it, yeah. Go ahead. It's it's kind of a, you know, conspiracy theorists. They they're out there and they're like, oh, I gotta know. Um, those are the mm-hmm. same people who are like UFO hunters and and uh, Sasquatch hunters. <laughs> Mm-hmm. The same mm-hmm. mentality goes hand in hand, right there. Right, right. Wow, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I, I have some more facts written down here if we want to go over them. Go for it. So, uh, let's see. So there were three nuclear plants that were used to make Fat Man and Little Boy on uh, the bombs for Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So. Oh, yeah. And, and the reason they had that was three nuclear plants separately because no one plant would have the complete designs to the bomb. You see what I'm saying? Oh, so they were separate, yeah. Yeah, and they had to, I guess, um, they had to have that. By the way, you know, to anyone listening, you guys should go look up footage of the tests that were done because you'll see there were houses that were built in, like, Nevada and, you know, where the majority of uh, tests were conducted to see the damage that could be done to the houses from a distance. Yeah. And you'll see footage of it literally blowing up the house, like just, Oh my God. And it's slow motion sometimes. And it's just insane. The power of this weapon. And then you won't understand it until you see footage of it. You know, I think they did a bunch of tests in the Midwest in particular, because there's so much open uh-huh. land there. Yeah. So they yeah. they pretty much they constructed a bunch of pseudo towns, yeah, a bunch probably, of fake yeah. little towns like nuke towns, 
and <laughs> Nuketown. <laughs> Call of Duty reference. I know. Uh, <laughs> they <laughs> they set up like these mannequins too, and they're like, "Oh, well, what could it yeah. do to a, a a certain object?" And right, they they end up finding later that it pretty much destroys everything. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Scary to think about. Yep. Yeah, another another little fact is you know shadows of the people were that you know in japan where the bombs were blown up or detonated shadows of those people were burned permanently into the pavements from the blast so oh yeah yeah you if you look it up you'll see shadows of people of uh humans and and their their i don't know just their whole shadow is just like like burned into the walls it was like imprinted and yeah. yeah imprinted uh i guess i don't know it was just such a strong blast and i think because it was so instant yeah Yeah. it was such a massive amount of energy that it actually well the ashes of the human body itself right so there's got to be some type of matter left over from a human being being disintegrated yeah i think it actually imprinted those ashes onto the pavement of where the shadow was oh Uh, dude (laughs) (laughs) next fact Yes, next fact. Uh, give me just one second here. Go for it. Uh, okay, pilots are told to crash their planes if they need to, not on land. Or, sorry, on land, not uh, on sea, at sea, because of uh, the contamination of the water. Um, you know, so basically when all this radiation hits, uh, I guess, water, I don't know why, I don't think their planes the would have radiation, right? Maybe maybe leftover. I, maybe I think the currents in the ocean are much stronger, so they're afraid that radiation can actually spill into the ocean and spread much quicker. Uh, and maybe it can get to like nearby cities or something like that. Um, but I I thought you were going with um, if you were discovered or if you were going to be um, or somehow the the plane malfunctioned, you were supposed to crash. Um, or something like that, so you can destroy like the evidence. <laughs> oh yeah, or something no, I'm sure like that. I thought you were going. Yeah, I'm going. I'm pretty sure you were going that route, but yeah. No, you. No, weren't. yeah. That that's another thing. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, I think radiation in general in in oceans is not a good thing. That's part of the reason I think it spreads. Um, I don't know. I guess Makes more. Sense. Yeah. Um, okay. So next fact. Uh, in the little boy explosion, less than one kilogram of the 64 kilograms of enriched uranium actually underwent nuclear fission. That's, I mean, what, like one to two percent of the total. Oh. Wow. It only so, operated at two percent of its of its power. <laughs> yeah, about one to two percent. Yeah. And of that, uh, less than one gram or one kilogram. Only 0.6 grams, not 0.6 kilograms, 0.6 grams. You know how 0.6 grams is literally nothing, dude. Like, yeah. I, I'm, I can hold like 0.6. A speck of salt. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 0.6 grams were transferred into kinetic energy and heat energy and radiation. Wow. Insane, huh? Insane indeed. Um,. What else? Neutron bombs. I covered that. Okay, so there's a timer that actually sets off when the bombs dropped. And that timer is, you know, we need to have a certain amount of time for the pilots to get away. Because if, you know, obviously they don't, they're going to get caught in the <laughs> collateral damage, essentially, you know. Yep. Um, so it's, I think, at least 15 seconds after the bomb is dropped where, you know, you have to wait at least 15 seconds. So the pilot has time to fly away and i'm sure you know in that 15 seconds when the pilot's flying the plane he's probably you know, shitting his pants you know like he's like oh shit oh shit <laughs> i gotta get fuck. away <laughs> i have 15 <laughs> seconds to make this happen if i don't i'm fucked <laughs> so that's um, so scary yeah so you know i'm sure i'm assuming he like cranks up the engine and just flies at, at you know maximum speed away from from the bomb uh, at which 15 seconds later the bomb is detonated and that's what it is. Or the, I'm not I'm not saying it's exactly 15 seconds, but it has to be at least 15 seconds. Do you know if there's a certain altitude that the bomb has to be dropped from? 
Uh, not too sure. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, I'm I'm assuming yes because the pilot can't be too low because then I think it would cause damage to the plane and, and yeah, air. like what's the minimum safety altitude? Like you can't be too close to the ground or else you'll get caught in the blast. Yeah, be pretty high up, be... I think. Yeah. But think about it. You also can't be way too high because then the bomb might not even land in the proper place. That's true, right? So yeah. the projectile science behind that is it's very tricky. Yeah. Credit to bombers out there because they really know what they're doing, and the pilots do. Yeah. Um, yeah, they gotta they gotta be at that sweet spot, and then they yeah. gotta go at a certain speed, and then they have fifteen mm-hmm. seconds to leave. <laughs> <laughs> so that's very stressful time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um. So, I mean, that's what it is, right? And then uh, more nuclear weapons were tested actually under under water. Underwater, yeah, under the ocean. Yeah, and you'll you'll see how. I think I don't know if I saw footage of one, but it was basically the whole. It's like massive, like the the water just flies up, and it's just insane. Like you know, the, I just I feel so bad for the fish, and you know, whatever <laughs> was there, man, <laughs> obliterated. Yeah, seriously. And not only that, the radiation that fell. Uh, there was an area specifically somewhere in some very small island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean that they conducted tests. And um, all, so many of the fish in that area, they found out had like radiation poisoning and all that. And they were just coming up dead, like out of the water. Yeah, actually, we didn't talk about this. Let's talk about the effects of radiation. Okay, that's a yeah. big thing that comes from nukes. Okay. Um, I actually did. I didn't do much research on that. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> from stories I've heard, like radiation. Yeah. Um, for example, going to Chernobyl. Do you know about that? The the failed power plant um, situation. No. In in Ukraine, I think. Um, you don't okay. know about that? No, no. <clears throat> so, uh, little history here. Uh, Chernobyl had was a city. It was a town in in Russia, in Ukraine, somewhere in that area. Um, right. It ended up failing, um, and it ended up contaminating the whole town. So, you oh, have to, you have to, yeah, was it Chernobyl? from a nuclear power plant? A nuclear power plant. Yep. Okay. Um, so it, it was it was meant to provide energy to the town, but uh, something happened, and then a malfunction occurred, and like the the water wasn't like cooling the the reactors, or like uh, something was wrong with the uh, the radiation counter or something like i don't know so this disaster disaster happened in 1986 and uh it says here the number four nuclear reactor at the chernobyl nuclear power plant near the low abandoned town of pirat in northern Mm. soviet russia ukraine right um so we got a reactor failing and it ended up uh being a very catastrophic uh, event where it pretty much uh contaminated the whole town and i have pictures here of the whole town just being completely abandoned and it's like a horror movie like you have all these you have all these buildings like you have these parks you have these apartment buildings you have like a railway uh everything's just so dead like there's animals dead everywhere Uh, everything's like dark and and disgusting and yeah. there's like no life whatsoever like the trees they they have like no leaves on them mm-hmm. and uh i think over time now there's actually like wildlife and stuff like that but right. at the time it was just it was just a dead town yeah um, so the effects of radiation going back to that uh i think they came back to the town of pirat i think that's what it's called okay they did some experiments and they found actually wildlife were adapting to the radiation itself that actually was uh, contaminating the the town. So they found like insects okay. was that were mutated. They found uh, animals that had like third arms or something like that, Ugh. and just like monstrosities that that uh, lived there. Um, so they were right. ultimately doing experiments and they were trying to get data on how wildlife adapted to uh radiation in general um, wow and actually i can just i can just type it in here uh 
irradiated uh, wildlife. And uh, it's kind of weird what they... Animals living in contaminated areas uh, around this suffer from a variety of state of side effects caused by radiation. Uh, so they have wolves in there being contaminated. Uh, what else do we got here? Uh, I'm on Wikipedia right now. Okay. Uh, so what happened? La, 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 la. Radiation and wildlife at 30 years after Chernobyl. Uh, live research here, folks. Um <laughs> So, watches well, animal tracks. It seems the yada yada yada. Wolf experts. Uh, how well the elements are doing in the exclusion zone. Uh, research signs of life. Uh, every saw. Horses. A rare indigenous species. Wildlife. La, la, la. Um, so, I guess the main takeaway from this is that uh, life was able to live uh, even though radiation was still uh, affecting the, the area. And, right. Um, it says here that the Chernobyl disaster affected a little more than sixteen hundred square miles, uh, huh. in radius. So they've got some. Makes a sister. Oh, that's disgusting. Okay, <laughs> I just I just I just looked at a mutated fox. Oh. Uh, so you know what's? Uh, I just looked this up right now. There's um. It says, let's see right here, a nuclear power provides around 20% of the electricity used in the U.S. It's a lot of, it's a lot of energy. <laughs> yeah, one-fifth of the electricity used in the U.S. is powered by nuclear. That's insane. Yeah, it's a highly effective use of power. Um, yeah. It's supposed to be one of the safe, uh, but there's a lot of controversy behind it where it's like, oh, it, it, it contributes to... Uh, global warming or um it's not safe for the environment or it, right. it's very controversial how do but, nuclear power plants work though so the idea behind that um is they have to basically control the uh radioactive material so in this uh example what they use in those power plants is uranium and plutonium so going back to how they use it and how they actually uh, contain it, they go through a, a heavily purification process uh, through chemicals and, and combination and centrifuges where they actually uh, they encapsulate uh, uranium into these small pellets. And these pellets are like, they're not too small, mm -hmm. but they're like the size of a maybe like a small golf ball. Okay. Uh, so, so they're kind of small, but these pellets, uh, I looked up, I looked online, where one pellet is equal to 149 gallons of oil in terms of energy. Mm. Uh, so these pellets are no joke. Uh, so what they do is they attach these pellets in a rod, okay. in like this like glass rod, and they pretty much stack them in a tube, and then they ship those tubes to uh, certain power plants. So what happens is. Uh, they have to control the uranium within that tube uh, very carefully. So mm -hmm. they have to uh, they have to cool it down with a certain amount of water, and they have to keep it contained in like this certain area. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think what the main cause of failure and malfunction in power plants is the inability to actually cool the the uranium itself okay. so you constantly have to clock the the cooling process when it comes to actually uh, causing reactions to the uranium so there's in order for the power to be generated uh like we were saying like fusion and fission um they keep that uh on a lower scale where the amount of energy is being produced like through these reactions uh but a lot of heat is produced from that. So they have to cool that process constantly. Right. Um, from what I remember, to be honest. Uh, you're going to have to fact check me on that. But I think, I think I'm think i right on saying that most of the malfunctions are from inability to cool this process uh, 
through a through a continuous time. So that's the idea behind a power plant. But uh, looking here on the effects of of the the radioactive uh, area here. Um, so non-existent, yada yada yada. Uh, I don't care about that. Wildlife. Yeah, radiation. It's it's no joke. Um, uh, ooh, radioactive spiders. That's creepy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um. Oh yeah, that's free. That's really weird. Uh, they have mutant cows that grew like yeah. extra limbs, and their mouth is like in the wrong area. Uh, oh god. So what radiation does. Um. What does it do? I think it. Uh. It decays, uh, it decays wildlife in a, a special way. So we know that uh, radiation is from the sun through X-rays, right? Right. And you know when you go into your local doctor, your lo your local dentist, you usually go into like an X-ray machine, like an mm -hmm. MRI or like a, a X-ray uh, test on your teeth, right. and um, a very effective way of of getting. Uh, it's like invisible images of your teeth or of your brain but uh, what is uh, it's been such a long time <laughs> yeah from from x-ray uh, physics here um, but what's so dangerous about radiation is that uh, it's a certain wave that comes from a source like from the from the sun for example so right. let's take the sun, for example. The sun will give off x-rays, which is radioactive. Mm -hmm. And those x-rays will actually interact with your body. And similar to uh, being from sun rays, like burn your skin. So you have like sunburn. Mm -hmm. Well, what uh, the x-rays do is they, they mess with, uh, I think they mess with the skin, something beneath that. Uh let me let me the actually the genes the dna the i think yeah some of it with like uh the dna they alter it or something like uh right. chromosomes they affect those uh which is why they have extra limbs and all that sort of thing right it just grows in the wrong place like it like the... i think it messes with the genetic makeup to be honest yeah. where it um it kind of like shifts the dna in a way where it's like it it messes with the biology mm. um so I'm gonna I'm gonna type in radiation effect, um, radiation sickness. That's a real thing. Wow. And, Can you uh, imagine how evolution would you know be affected if you know we had massive amounts of people's genetics changing and extra limbs growing and things like? I mean, I mean, maybe for human beings it might not affect it as much, right? Because we're <clears throat> we're so advanced technologically. But imagine animals and how how the evolution would be changed forever uh because they would have to adapt right and it would kind of go back to it would sort of be like survival of the fittest right because people uh, those animals have developed certain characteristics and traits to survive in nature or in the environment right let's say so if that changes their genetic makeup changes they have mutations or whatever they have to sort of adapt right they have to change um, or they, they have to make sure that they at least live and pass on their genes. And based on, I mean, there's natural selection. That's one thing. But if you don't pass natural selection, you have, you got to at least pass sexual selection. Um, and if you okay. have a mutated animal for the most part, that's like very, very different from the rest, that animal is probably not going to reproduce, you know? Um, so Okay, so I think what you're trying to say is, uh, due to the mutation, it's a good chance that that mutation will not live in the next generation? Yes. Okay, through natural selection and whatnot and social Darwinism. Okay. Yeah. That kind of makes sense. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, radiation, it's, it's no joke. Uh, it's It's a... I think they're still doing research on it, to be honest. But it's a yeah. type of uh, it's a type of sickness that actually messes with the DNA of a certain uh, animal or a certain livestock. 
Right. right. And um, I'm looking here at the symptoms of, of radiation sickness. <laughs> so if you... That's funny. I was thinking about that. <laughs> so symptoms include... Uh, so the signs and symptoms of acute radiation poisoning uh, result in vomiting, diarrhea, uh, loss of appetite, headaches, rapid heartbeat. Um, a dose of as low as 30 rads can lead to loss of white blood cells, nausea, vomiting, headaches. A dose of 300 rads uh, results in hair loss, uh, damage to nerve cells, damage to cells that line in the, the digestive tract. And it could end up being to the case where uh, if you're exposed to 1,000 rads within a short time, uh, this could be fatal. Uh, however, higher doses can be applied to a smaller area of the body with less risk. Um, so I guess it depends on the area of where the dosage is applied. Right. Um, so I'm not really sure how that works, to be honest. Uh, so a person who is exposed to 3,000 rads will experience nausea and vomiting, and they may experience confusion and a loss of consciousness uh, within a few hours. Uh, tremors and convulsions will occur five to six hours after exposure. Uh, within three days, uh, there will be coma and death. So 3,000 rads is the max. Oh, that's that's the, the least 3, amount. 3,000. Isn't that why cancer patients go bald? Because they go they through go, radiation therapy and all that sort of yeah, thing? Yeah, they and... go through chemo and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the idea behind chemo, that's a treatment, uh, is they try to kill the cancer tumor uh, through radiation, right? So there's the mm. side effects of losing your hair. There's the side effects of uh, there's the side effect of losing white blood cells, for example. I know that's a fact, um, okay. and that's not a good thing because white blood cells really they fight off any kind of disease or virus in the body. Right. But uh, yeah, that's that's a a major symptom that that occurs from radiation uh, treatment. Right. So. I mean, cancer's no joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To, to go to the length of radiation treatment, cancer is really, that's a bad sickness to have. Yeah. Where the doctor's like, okay, the only cure is to actually bombard you with radiation. <laughs> Seriously, dude. That's a drastic thing to go to, like through, you know? Um, yeah, it is. Yeah. We can have a talk on cancer too, I'm sure. An academy. Oh, that. that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah cancer in general i don't know much about cancer to be honest i never had a family member that had cancer or actually knew anybody that had cancer Me but too, nowadays actually. it feels like it's common like i go to the news i'm like oh this person got cancer yeah, or, uh, yeah. this person got cancer yeah uh, there's all kinds of cancer there's breast cancer there's uh what else is there different types of cancer that i can't really name off of right now pancreatic cancer yeah uh, all that type of stuff. Uh, but with radiation, it, it's a common thing because we all experience radiation on a daily basis, I believe. Mm. Uh, so like when you watch television, uh, when you're on an airplane, uh, when you're going through like with those security scanners, like mm. the, the, the metal detectors, mm -hmm. uh, those are somewhat radiated. Cell phones. <laughs> right, <laughs> Every day. Right. Give off some radiation. Seriously. Um, so, so, so radiation, it's natural. It's a, it's a mm. natural type of... Uh, light natural type of frequency uh um, yeah so i'm actually gonna type this in radiation uh frequency spectrum i think from the nukes it's a neutron frequency it's a neutron and uh gamma rays gamma rays ew okay yeah i'm looking at the spectrum right here uh so gamma rays are the most dangerous I believe. Okay. Um, cause I'm looking at the spectrum right now and to the left is a uh, low frequency to the right is high frequency. So if you experience a wave that has a lot of frequency, mm. it is going to be damaging to your body. So for example, x-rays, gamma rays, um, those waves have a lot of frequency. Um, mm -hmm. x-rays have frequencies up to, 10 to the 16 to 10 to the 20 and the gamma yeah. rays have 10 to the 20 uh to the higher right. to infinity essentially uh 
let's see here types of radio waves and applications uh, so yada 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 um, all the science here so much science today uh, you got this you got that x-rays yeah um, wish I, I wish I could have done more research on uh, radioactive uh, rays and the yeah, effects on them. Rays. <laughs> but yeah, uh, let's see here. We are at 155. We can call it an episode. Oh, we are? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> we're, we're here desperately trying to fill the two hours. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think we got I, I a kinda, good amount of information in. I think so. Uh, we kind of went slow at the end right there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that was our episode on, on nuclear weapons. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, I guess we'll call it an episode. Yep. Yep. All right. Take care, everyone. Sounds good. Take care. Thanks for listening. <laughs>